Good morning, and welcome to today's webcast, Uncovering Tax Planning Opportunities for 2024 and Beyond. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thank you for viewing our webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters for Moss Adams, Boomer Wells, Business Development Manager, Michelle Van Dellen, Partner, and Charity Falls, Tax Managing Director. Michelle Van Dellen has practiced public accounting with Moss Adams since 1993 and is a member of the private clients team, where she currently serves as the office tax leader. She is recognized for her technical tax knowledge involving flow through entity structures, business succession and transition issues, and income, gift, and estate planning. Charity has been an, a trusted advisor for business owners and their families and to business leaders since 2003. A tax and estate planning attorney by background, she advises clients on matters related to tax, estate planning, trust design, business entity formation, business succession, and family dynamics. With that, I'll turn it over to Boomer, our moderator, to get us started. All right, thank you for the intro, Chad. Hi, everybody, I'm Boomer Wells. Welcome to our webcast, Uncovering Tax Planning Opportunities for 2024 and Beyond. We are happy you're here. This topic keeps us quite busy, and judging by the number of attendees we have today, this is a relevant topic for you too, and will be for some time to come. Today we'll dis discuss the Tax Cuts and Job Act of 2017. What is it, and why is it important? We'll discuss that here today. Now, we're gonna get to the discussion. The first question I'll offer up is, what is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, and why are we talking about it in 2024? Charity, we'll start with you. Thanks, Boomer. Um, well, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was sort of sweeping legislation uh, for, uh, dealing with tax that, um, by its own terms, it was intended to lower the corporate tax rates. Um, the Congress said to modernize our economy. Um, it was intended to drive economic growth and to, to simplify the U.S. tax structure. Um, the law made permanent changes to corporate tax rates, but provisions affecting individuals under the law are set to automatically sunset, which means they will expire at the end of 2025. So um, what we'll do is elaborate on some of these later, but um, the expiring provisions, if not addressed before the sunset, sunset date, they include you know, increased top income tax rates, reinstatement of certain deductions like moving expenses and miscellaneous itemized deductions. Um, it will reduce um, certain deductions for people with um, higher incomes. Um, and without action, we'll see significantly more estates that owe estate taxes. Um, we'll also see reductions in expense deductions for business owners and increased tax liabilities for owners of pass-through business entities. Um, the alternative minimum tax, it was sort of this hated tax, it's going to, again, affect a larger swath of the population by subjecting, um, you know, income over a certain amount to a minimum 28% rate. Um, and then um, on the positive side, the $10,000 cap on state and local income and property taxes will go away, which is very positive for many of us in high tax states like California and New York. Um, we'll also see that qualified opportunity zones 
will no longer be eligible for deferral or adjustment to basis or exclusion on gains. So this is sort of a brief overview and we'll dive more deeply into some of these things um, throughout the talk. All right, thank you, Charity. Well, part of what we wanna talk about today involves the sunsetting of certain provisions in the 2017 Tax Cuts and Job Act. Can you help us understand how we got here? Sure. Um, so under normal Senate filibuster rules, 60% vote is required to pass legislation in the Senate. Um, and so, but, but there's this exception, it's called budget reconciliation. And it's a special exception to the general rule that was created in the 1970s, which permits the Senate to reconcile budgetary matters. And reconciliation bills can pass the Senate by a simple majority vote, um, but they can only deal with three matters or three topics rather, and that's spending, um, revenue, and the federal debt limit. And those are the only matters that reconciliation bills you know, can address. And the Senate can pass three per year, one affecting each of spending, revenue, and the federal debt limit. Um, reconciliation was used to pass the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, um, as well as the COVID stimulus plan, which is referred to the, as the American Rescue Plan of 2021, and also the Inflation Protection Act in 2022, which was sort of a compromise bill that came out of the Build Back Better um, plan negotiations. Um, so, you know, remember that for a bill to become law, legislation must be adopted by both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, and once passed by both houses of Congress, then it goes to the president for signature. So budget reconciliation is typically successful um, when, you know, it can go to both bodies of Congress get a majority vote in both houses, and then also be signed you know, by the president in um, power at that time. Now, in today's day and age, reconciliation is only likely to happen when both houses of Congress and the presidency is controlled by the same party, just because there's a lot of, um, you know, let's call it fervent disagreement by lawmakers on the left and in the right today. Um, so the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, Jobs Act was passed in 2017 when the Republicans held slim majorities in both the House and the Senate and the presidency was held by Trump. And so you'll see that's why this was able to come into fruition um, when it did in 2017. All right, well, we are hearing a lot about a possible sunsetting. Michelle, which provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act expire and which do not? Um, thanks, Boomer. So for starters, I just want to mention that TCJA enacted a number of changes in the international tax area. These are very complex and involved. We won't be covering anything related to international tax today. And before we move into more detail on the sunsetting provisions, I do want to touch on a few of the significant corporate and business tax changes that are permanent. And I say permanent loosely because it's only until the next new tax law is passed and signed. Um, of these permanent provisions, the most well known out there is the <clears throat> reduction of the federal top corporate income tax rate from 35% to 21 percent. Um, the TCJA also repealed the corporate alternative minimum tax. So that is gone permanently. And these measures were intended to more closely align U.S. corporate tax policy with those of, of other developed countries who are trading partners. Um, in that, now, that was the major tax cut for corporations. Now, one of the revenue raising items is the Section 163J interest limitation. Um, those of you who have businesses impacted by this will know what I'm talking about. This limits the amount of net interest expense a business can deduct to um, the amount of net interest income plus 30% of adjusted taxable income. This has been phased in um, over a number of years and is directed at larger businesses. So um, those with greater than 25 million in gross receipts. Uh, but it is a permanent uh, revenue raiser out there. So uh, something we'll have to deal with for a while. Net operating losses was the other big revenue raiser. Uh, they changed the availability of net operating losses to be used. They, um, after 2020, it was originally supposed to be effective in 2018, but because of COVID, the implementation was delayed. And um, net operating losses are limited to 
just 80% of taxable income. So you won't be able to use your net operating losses to bring taxable income to zero. And um, also they're available now for carry forward only. So um, so those losses can't be you go back to claim refunds anymore. There are some exceptions, um, farming being one of those exceptions where some limited carrybacks are still available. But uh, in general, those losses are going to be going forward only. Um, a few a couple significant changes on the depreciation front. One positive, one negative. Section 179. Now, this is one early in my career we uh, used all the time. It was front and center, uh, a big tax benefit for small businesses. With the advent of the bonus depreciation rule, Section 179 took a back seat and hasn't gotten a lot of attention in recent years. So a quick refresher, it allows an immediate deduction for the cost of qualified property placed in service during the year. It is directed at small business, so there's a cap in place on the total dollar value of property. Um, you can't put more than that dollar amount of property in service and still qualify for Section 179. TCJA did raise the maximum amount of Section 179 deduction that's available. So it used to be 500,000, now it's a million adjusted for inflation. So for 2024, it's just over 1.2 million. Um, and the phase out starts when a business puts more than $3 million worth of property into service. <clears throat> okay, so, but while the benefits of Section 179 are increasing and becoming more available, bonus depreciation is in the process of being phased out. So for qualified property placed in service in 2024, the bonus depreciation amount is, amount is limited now to 60% of the property. So you used to be able to deduct 100% of the cost of the property placed in service. For 2024, it is 60%. This is down from the 80% <coughs> that was allowed in 2023 and more than the 40%, which will be allowed for 2025. It'll be 20, 20% 20, 20 for 2026 and then phase out at zero after that. Okay, so for gift and estate taxes, moving on to the next slide. The, um, <clears throat> the gift and estate tax system is unified, meaning that the lifetime exemption is applied first to gifts and then to transfers at death. Any excess transfers above the lifetime exemption are subject to gift or estate tax at 40%. There's also a generation skipping tax, um, which we refer to as GST, which evident from the name. This is a parallel system that um, it runs beside the gift and estate tax regime designed to catch and tax those transfers which skip a generation, such as from a grandparent to a grandchild. <clears throat> Since 2003, uh, the lifetime exemption has increased either from actual changes in the exemption amount or as the result of inflation adjustments <clears throat> from $1 million per person, or excuse me, since 2002, from $1 million per person to $13.61 million per person in 2024. That means that a married couple today can, over their lifetimes, move over $27 million in value of assets to their heirs without the payment of federal gift or estate tax. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Upon sunset, the lifetime exemption will drop to the pre-TCJA amount of $5 million per person that is adjusted for inflation. Um, that will start in 2026. We don't know the exact amount, but we estimate it'll come in at around $7 million per person. 14 million per married couple, roughly half of what it is today. If that extra 6.6 .6 million, the difference between the exemption today of 13.6 million and what it will be in 2026, say 7 million, isn't used through the making of taxable gifts, then it will disappear January 1st and no longer be available. 
So planning to use the lifetime exemption obviously applies to individuals or couples who have sufficient net worth to make large gifts, yet retain enough wealth to fund their remaining lifespans and desired lifestyles. So the moral of the story is just because you could doesn't mean you should. In most cases, we recommend that estate planning process include personal financial planning and lifetime cash flow planning to determine the lifestyle impact of significant gifts. <clears throat> Most of the time, gifts of this size are made via trust. Often generation skipping trusts are intended to benefit multiple beneficiaries. Since these trusts are irrev irrevocable, you wanna allow enough time to think through the desired provisions of the trust and consider all the options. These are not decisions that you wanna be faced with approaching the sunset in, 2020, in December of 2025. <clears throat> Another thing to consider is that um, there are a limited number of estate planning attorneys, accountants, and other advisors available. We anticipate significant demand for our services as we get into 2025. So we are recommending that you consider taking some initial steps now such as financial planning and cash flow modeling that i just mentioned uh, you can also have desired trusts drafted now um, set them aside and then wait to fund them until we get closer to december of 2025. so if we want to move on to the next slide we can talk about some of the other provisions that expire One of the most impactful changes will be the elimination of the 20% qualified business QBI deduction. This deduction is available to owners of pass-through entities, LLCs, partnerships, and S-corporations. It's a deduction up to 20% of their qualified business income. This deduction, <coughs> in effect, lowers the top individual tax rate from 37% to 29.6% on qualified business income. For certain types of businesses, professional service firms, consulting firms, medical practices, prof um, professional athletes, the QBI deduction phases out at higher income levels. If this provision is not extended, the result will be a large tax increase to business owners whose businesses are conducted through pass-through entities. Another significant change will be the elimination of the excess business loss limitation. Anyone who's been impacted by this one will know what I'm talking about. This provision limits the deductibility of business losses <coughs> against other, excuse me. Against other not business income. The excess losses are suspended and treated as net operating loss carryovers to the following tax year. When passed, the limitation was 500,000 for joint filers, but with inflation, the limitation for 2024 has increased to 610,000 for joint filers, 305,000 for other filers. Unfortunately, <coughs> the Inflation Reduction Act extended this limitation by two years, so we will have to wait until January 1st of 2029 to put this one into the rear view. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what will happen with itemized deductions after the sunset. The biggest change, as Charity mentioned, for many people will be the removal of the $10,000 cap on the deductibility of state and local taxes. That cap will go away beginning in 2026 and an individual state and local taxes will be fully deductible as an itemized deduction. <clears throat> now the removal of this cap will have a ripple effect on the pass through entity legislation enacted in many states. As of February 36 states, have enacted PTE legislation and three more states have proposed PTE bills. While each state has their own nuances, in general, the PTE legislation allows a pass-through entity, such as an LLC partnership or S corporation, to directly pay the state, <clears throat> to the state, the owner's share of the state income tax on that entity's taxable income. 
ask, since the pass-through entity pays the tax directly to the state, it is allowed to claim that tax as a business tax deduction for federal income tax purposes, in effect, making the owner state tax expenses deductible. The owners then take a state tax credit on their individual state income tax return for their proportionate share of the state tax paid by the pass-through entity. In many states, the election is effective indefinitely. However, <coughs> some states limit the election to which the $10,000 cap applies. Other states provide that the PTE laws are automatically repealed if the federal SALT cap provisions no longer apply. So some of these laws may go away with the end of the SALT cap. You'll want to check with your tax advisor in, with respect to the PTE provisions in your state so you can plan accordingly. Um, if moving on to home mortgages, the deductibility of interest on home mortgages and home equity debt will return to pre-TCJA levels. We'll also see the return of the P's limitation the P's limitation has come and gone over the years and will return with the sunset of TCJA. The P's limitation is named after late Congressman Donald Peace, who originally proposed the limitation. It applies a 3% haircut to overall itemized deductions and can reduce those itemized deductions by up to 80%. There are a number of other expiring provisions, which I will touch on quickly before going back to charity. Standard deduction will revert to the original lower levels. Uh, we'll see the return of personal exemptions. The highest marginal tax rate will revert from 37% back to 39.6%, and taxpayers that were subject to AMT prior to 18, but not in recent years, will likely see its return beginning with their 2026 tax return filings. All right. Well, thank you, Michelle. And Michelle mentioned potential tax changes on the horizon as a result of the law's sunset. Charity, do you expect Congress to extend the expiring provisions of the 2017 tax law? Well, I think I'll start um, with a bit of a history lesson and then look at the national debt and answering this question. Um, Michelle touched on a lot of technical issues and I kind of want to talk more about tax policy on this on this question. Um, so it, first of all, it's important to understand that we do not have a flat tax that subjects you know, all of a person's income um, to a specific rate. Our system is instead graduated, which means that you know, only income in excess of a certain bracket is subject to a higher rate. Um, so when people say, you know, I shouldn't have gotten that raise because it put me in a higher tax bracket, you know, I know it's time to talk to them. <laughs> um, but the first income tax in the US was signed into law by Abraham Lincoln to raise money for the Civil War. The 16th Amendment allow, you know, allowed the U.S. government to tax individuals in states without apportionment among the states, um, and this was not ratified until 1913, um, and it had a modest tax, a top tax bracket at that time of 7%. Um, and then World War I came along, and to finance the war, the top rate was increased to 77%. And then after the war, the top rate decreased again to 25%. Um, during the Depression, the top rate was again increased to 63%. Um, you know, we're currently talking about a potential increase to 39.7%. So, you know, that's still significantly less than these other, you know, rates during um, times of high spending. So again, during the depression, the rate was at 63%. In 1944, um, during World War II, the top rate increased to a whopping 94%. And for more than 30 years after that, the rate never dipped below 70% for the top rate. And rates have steadily come downward, you know, beginning in the 1980s. And since then, the top individual income tax rates have fluctuated between 28% and 39.6%. And it's currently sitting under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act at 37%. And upon um, sunset, we're looking at 39.6% um, again. So, um, you know, um, both rates are you know, relatively low if you look at them in the historic context. Um, corporate rates have a similar history and they're also graduated. Um, the cut to 21% um, 20, uh, by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017 resulted in the lowest corporate tax rate since 1939. 
um, you know, compared that to historical rates, you know, the top corporate income tax rate hovered around 50% during the Eisenhower, LBJ, and Nixon administrations, and it was even 40% during the Reagan administration. Um, it was cut in 1988 to fight the recession to 34% and remained basically at 35% during the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations. Um, thus, so, you know, while the sunset of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will revert back to that 39.6% top rate, um, it is fairly standard, you know, by historical comparison. And this is especially true in light of the stimulus measures that were taken to address the COVID pandemic. Um, also, aging baby boomer population is becoming eligible for Medicare, Social Security, which are, you know, high cost items for um, the government. And, and if you look back at other times of great spending, like World War I and World War II, rates have been increased dramatically due to this collective need you know, to spend on what the nation um, determined were warranted costs. And not unlike COVID stimulus or helping our seniors maintain housing and healthcare into their older years, um, but the tax rates and revenues are significantly down. And thus what we're seeing are these growing deficits and this you know, ballooning national debt as a result. So reduced tax revenues, you know, coupled with increased spending can only uh, you know, continue to inflate this debt um, what we don't know is when we'll reach that tipping point, if ever, and what will happen to our economy as a result. Um, right now, interest rates around the world are still relatively low, um, so the U.S. can continue to pay the interest on the debt burden. Um, but what happens if interest rates continue to rise? I mean, that's a, that's a big question mark. Um, and then what if we have another pandemic or another catastrophe? What does it look like for the U.S. to default on its obligations? You know, can the debt continue to grow um, faster than the economy forever? Um, these are all really tough questions and ones I think, you know, we should think about um, as a populace when thinking about tax policy and the collective pain that we feel when we of paying taxes. Um, you know, at the federal level, our tax dollars are being spent um, basically in this order uh, for Medicare, Medicaid grants to states and then other health services. That makes up about 30 percent of our um, spending in the U.S. And then national defense is, is next at about um, close to 17 percent. And then Social Security is 16%. But then interest alone on the national debt, just the interest portion, it's approximately 12% of spending at this point. Just And then servicing the principal and interest on the national debt costs almost as much annually now as Social Security or the national defense. Um, according to the Congressional Budget Office, the interest alone costs the U.S. over $650 billion in 2023 because the national debt currently hovers around 34 and a half trillion dollars. And to understand what a trillion dollars looks like, there's a really neat graphic online. There are actually many, um, but but one in particular I thought was a great pictorial il illustration of this is a trillion dollars is shown as seven foot stacks of hundred dollar bills side by side um, for seven feet spanning 2.2 acres. So that's bigger than the width and the length of a football field. Um, so that's one trillion. Now you multiply that by 34 and a half and that's the national debt today, which is you know continuing to grow every single day. Um, and people ask, you know, can't we just print more money and pay off the debt? And the answer is yes and no. Um, Congress controls spending as laid out in the Constitution. And when Congress passes a law such, such as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which approves spending, the Federal Reserve then buys Treasury securities on the open market from banks, and then banks credit that money to their reserves who then, of course, lend that out to the public in the form of mortgages and business loans. And these actions infuse cash into the economy. Um, most public debt is owned by investors, but the Fed owns about 28% of the outstanding Treasury securities. Um, some people believe that sort of creating money in this way will lead to an economic disaster because Treasury securities are U.S. debt secured by uh, the full faith and credit of the U.S., which means its ability to support its liabilities using its taxing authority. Um, others argue that the U.S. can print money all at once because of its nature as being sort of a powerful nation with a strong military and because its treasuries are in demand all around the world um, and it, you know, has the ability to tax its, its citizens to pay these, these um, you know, costs. Um, but Congress, you know, passes tax law. And if Congress is ideologically opposed to taxing its citizens to pay for expenditures and yet it doesn't curb spending, then the debt will continue to balloon. And the question then is, you know, how much is too much and what is that tipping point? Um, so regardless of, you know, what ultimately happens, the government is facing increasing health care costs 
an aging baby boomer population, becoming eligible for Social Security and Medicare, and the cost to um, service this interest on the debt is ballooning. Um, so on top of all these burgeoning costs, corporate income tax rates were permanently, as, as Michelle mentioned, slashed in the 2017 Tax Act from 35% to 21%. And rates on individuals owning closely held businesses were effectively cut, reducing, you know, significant reductions to, re to revenue. So you couple that with the impacts of COVID, you know, all the spending that was made on COVID and the picture just, you know, becomes worse. So, um, you know, these Medicare, Social Security, defense, you know, these things have costs um, and they're rising uh, faster than inflation. And we know that many Americans have little to no savings to rely on, um, and they rely on Social Security and Medicare for survival in their later years. Um, if these go away, you know, we we really have to think carefully about what the country will look like. So, you know, no one likes paying taxes, um, but it's important to understand why we have a system of taxation. And you know, throughout the world and throughout history, we've seen violence as an in income inequality grows. Um, it's what spawned the French Revolution, Tsarist Russia, you know, some argue within the American colonies rebelling against the monarchy. Um, so, you know, differences in political candidates' proposals are based on ideology, specifically um, which programs should be funded and whether they should be funded with actual revenue or with more debt. Um, and a compromise, <laughs> blending the two ideologies might be the best for the, the country's future stability. Um, so this is a very long-winded way of saying that um, extending the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act would require, you know, a literal act of Congress against these headwinds of the national debt. Um, there are certain aspects of the law that are very popular with the public and seem to have a lot of support, such as extending the qualified business income deduction for closely held business owners. We could see that um, being extended, um, but any extent, but any extension of um, these expiring provisions cost. Uh, come at the cost of lower revenue and less money in the coffers to cover rising costs, like for Social Security, Medicare, um, and defense. And of course, that means higher annual deficits and just continued growth of national debt. Thanks, Boomer. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Charity. All right, this will be our final question. And as a reminder, we have an audience Q&A after this. We are already seeing some really good questions coming in. So if you have questions, submit them now, and we will get to them after this final question. All right, Michelle, do we expect <clears throat> changes to the charitable framework as a result of the sunset? And what are other charitable planning considerations our clients should explore? Thanks, Boomer. And just to echo what Charity was talking about there um, a few minutes ago, you know, uh, what gets a lot of attention, especially with estate planners, is the loss of the lifetime exemption. But in terms of day-to-day -day tax impact for a lot of Americans out there, that 20% qualified business income deduction, the loss of that would really severely impact those um, small business owners um, who, with own who own the majority of which own pass through entities and um, really negatively impact them. So that's a big one that we're keeping an eye on and really rooting for uh, an extension of that particular provision. So before we move on to charitable planning, um, assuming you know that we do see this sunset, there are some basic estate planning techniques for individuals to consider moving forward. These are tried and true options that we used years ago back in the 90s before the lifetime exemption substantially increased. Um, and so it's time to dust them off and talk about them again. So the first thing to remember is that estate planning actually consists of two parts. There is the, there is the part of actually actively moving the current value of your assets out of your estate via making gifts. The second part is the future appreciation in your assets. So if you assume that your assets in general are going to grow, um, one of the things to consider is that, yes, you're may maybe making smaller gifts now, but if you are selective and you um, and you choose assets that are going to grow and you can push that future appreciation out of your estate, um, out of taxation. So this is where time really becomes your friend in this process. So even though you may be forced because of a lower exemption limit to make smaller gifts, if you're smart about choosing the assets with the opportunity for significant growth and you make those gifts early, you can move a lot of value out of your estate. And one thing to keep in mind is that even though the exemption will drop 
um, it still is adjusted for inflation. So if it drops to around 7 million, it'll immediately in the next year start creeping back up again. So um, there will be opportunities, even if you fully utilize your available exemption to make gifts moving forward as the exemption goes up. So you can also take advantage of those estate planning techniques that squish down the value of your gift. So allow you to move the gift, move property out of your estate, particularly property with the <clears throat> opportunity for growth um, while using a very small amount of your available lifetime exemption. So both GRATs, which are grantor retained annuity trusts, and Cuperts, which are qualified personal residence trusts, are vehicles which allow an individual to make a gift of appreciating property, such as a business interest or a residence, and then take back something of value, such as an annuity income stream in the case of a GRAT, or the personal use of a residence in the case of a Cupert. So the value of the actual gift is reduced by the net present value of the retained benefits. So you can move that property out, take back some set amount of income and get that appreci future appreciation of that property out of your estate. <clears throat> and don't forget annual exclusion gifts. Um, the annual exclusion is um, 18,000 for 2024. It's an annual exclusion that's adjusted for inflation. These gifts do not count against your lifetime exemption and you can spread them around multiple donees. So it's 18,000 per donee. So when you factor in children, in-laws, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, others, you can um, really actively on an every year basis be moving property out of your estate. So now on to charitable planning considerations. If you wanna switch to the next slide. <clears throat> so the only impact of the sunset on charitable giving is the AGI limitation for cash donations to public charities. It's been at 60% since 2018 and will revert back to 50% in 2026. We haven't seen many clients with charitable donations exceeding 50% of their AGI, so we don't anticipate that this will have a huge impact um, for charitable giving. There are some tried and true uh, charitable giving techniques um, that for those of you who are charitably inclined are worth considering um, as part of your estate plan. The most common and easiest to implement is our qualified charitable distributions, QCDs. Um, if you are 70 and a half or older, you are allowed to move up to $100,000 from your IRA directly to qualified charities, and that is excluded from taxable income. Now you don't get the deduction on Schedule A as an itemized deduction, but <clears throat> as I mentioned before, with the return of the P's limitation, and other, limit, and other limits, you're much better off having that 100,000 excluded from taxable income and foregoing the Schedule A deduction. So um, of importance to note is the transfer must go directly from the IRA to the charity. We have it happen more often than I'd like that um, an individual takes the donation or takes the IRA money and then donates it to charity and that does not qualify. It has to go directly to the charity from the IRA custodian. The other great thing about QCDs is they count against your required minimum distribution for each year. So if you don't need that money, you can direct it to charity and have it not be taxed. Donor advised funds allow you to time your charitable donations for maximum benefit. So for example, if you have a, a large transaction in a year, and you wanna maximize charitable deductions, you can establish a donor advised fund, donate cash, stocks, other assets. You can take a tax deduction for the amounts donated to the fund in the year you actually put the money into the fund. The money does not have to go out to the specific charities. It can be held in the donor advised fund. It can be invested, it can be earned a return. And when you're ready to have the fund grant, make grants to charities, you can advise the fund manager to do so. And uh, again, it's an advise. It's you, you can't just instruct, you can't direct, you can only advise, but that advice is usually taken. And those grants are made to the charities of your choice. So it's definitely something to have in your toolkit if you are um, 
interested in, in funding charities throughout the rest of your life. Charitable gift annuities are one uh, a planning option not particularly well known. Uh, see them a lot of times with universities. So it's a contract between a donor and a charity. You donate property to the charity, and in exchange, you receive a fixed income stream from the charity for the rest of your life. The main benefit of a charitable gift annuity is in its simplicity. Uh, it, it, unlike a charitable remainder trust, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, it, it's, it doesn't require a trust. It's simply a contract. And um, the main limitation is that obviously it's a contract with a specific charity. So you have to do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. <clears throat> Charitable remainder trusts are more complex. They are irrevocable trusts that let you donate property to charity, receive an income stream for life or a set number of years. The remainder beneficiaries of the trust are the charities who receive the property at the end of the trust. So again, you get a, a charitable deduction and um, get an income stream. The charity gets the remainder of the property. And finally, a charitable lead trust works in reverse. This is a situation where you let the charity get the income stream for a period of years, and then at the end, the remainder beneficiaries of the charity um, receive that property back from, from the trust. So that's what I've got for charitable donations, and I'll turn it back to Boomer. All right, thank you so much, Michelle. Well, we are seeing quite a few questions flood into the Q&A box. Uh, we will do our best to, to get to all of them. But the first one I'll start with is going to go to charity. And the question is, what year does the standard deduction revert to the former amounts? Okay, um, so after January 20, or January, I'm sorry, January 1st, 2026, the old 2017 standard deduction will apply plus um, inflation. And so that inflation is based on labor department, the labor department statistics. Um, and so it'll start beginning that year, 2026. Awesome, all right. Next one to Michelle. If you have used half of your 13.61 million, we still have 5 million available in 2026, if that's the new limit. No, so <clears throat> that's what's frustrating about this process or about this sunset is that if you have used, let's say by the end of 2025, you have used 5 million of your exemption and this, the sunset drops to seven, you only have the two. So, so the, the extra above what we anticipate to be seven is really kind of, is really a use it or lose it. So if you only go part way and you only make a seven million dollars, and I say only, you only make a seven million dollar gift um, between now and the end of 2025, the the exemption will sunset and it'll be at seven, and you will have in essence used all your interest, all your lifetime exemption. Now that doesn't mean it's it's not a it's not a great idea because you you know if it fits in with your estate plan and you are moving assets out of your state you're moving growth out of your state there are benefits to be had but it's not going it's not going to accomplish the specific goal of using that 13 million in order to use the full 13 million you've got to make actual 13 million of gifts before 2026. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, next one say, is going to go. I, I would just add something to that, and that's it. If you do give over um, the seven million, or what we predict it will be in 2026, if you give over that amount, um, but, but not the full 13, and then you know 2026 happens, the IRS has issued a ruling that say that it won't claw that back. It will treat it as having you know been done, and it will respect that as having been done in the past. So just wanted to add that. Awesome. Thank you, Charity. We're going to stick with you on this one. With the current interest rate environment being higher than the past several years, how does this impact potential estate planning techniques? Okay, well, Michelle mentioned um, Cuperts and Gratz earlier. Um, these are what we refer to as split interest gifts or split interest estate planning strategies. And in, um, in, in implementing those strategies, it requires the application of an IRS mandated interest rate. 
And um, when I say split interest, I mean what Michelle just described, where a person um, that transfers assets retains an interest in that asset, while a second person holds the right to the asset sometime in the future. Um, and so one example of this is the Qualified Personal Residence Trust, which with the cute name, you know, Cupert. Um, a Cupert, uh, when someone uses a Cupert, a person essentially transfers a personal home and a trust and retains the right to live in that home for a number of years. Um, and then on the expiration of that term, the home then passes either outright in, or in trust to another person. It's often, you know, a child. And the transferor, which is usually the parent, um, would continue to live in the home for, um, even after that time, as long as they were paying fair rental value um, for the home, you know, to either the child or the child's trust. And, and they do that because it removes that asset from the taxable estate without using a lot of the gift tax exemption. Um, in determining the value of the gift though, for gift tax purposes, the retained interest is valued and then subtracted from the total value in determining um, which portion is the gift portion. And that valuation is based on current interest rates. So um, when I first started advising clients, you know, 20 years ago, interest rates were high, even higher than today. And it made the Cooper a really attractive wealth transfer strategy um, because it, it increased the um, retained interest and, you know, reduced that gift portion that you would, you know, use uh, your, your lifetime exemption um, to transfer. And, but as the years have gone on, especially over the last 20 years, rates have just, you know, declined um, and they became less attractive, you know, for transferring wealth and reducing estate taxes. Um, but now we see rates of increase significantly over the last year or so. Um, so it sort of brought Cupert's back into favor. Um, uh, similarly, you know, sales to defective grantor trust, they're, you know, they're still very attractive often, um, depending on what assets are being transferred. But, um, you know, because of that IRS mandated interest rate um, is higher, those assets in the trust need to grow faster than the interest rate, and we call this a hurdle rate. Um, they need to grow faster in order to be as effective as they were before, so it's a much higher hurdle to meet um, and make it as, as effective as it used to be. And gifts to defective trust, though, are, are even more attractive now. As Michelle said, you know, we have these large exemptions that are going to have um, in 2026, and so making those gifts now to the extent you have a larger estate and locking that in um, before that sunset happens um, that's still a really great strategy. Um, and, and so anyway, I hope that helps explain the interest rate situation. Awesome. Thank you, Charity. Uh, Michelle, this is going to go to you. Um, somebody is asking, can you donate from your IRA or 401k to a donor advised fund? Unfortunately, no. Um, they're two, each great options on their own, but the IRS will not let that you combine them into a super option. So, no, if you are doing a donor advised fund, it cannot come as a qualified charitable distribution. Now, you can still use <clears throat> IRA funds to put into the donor advised fund, but it will come in as taxable income from your IRA and a deduction on your Schedule A as an itemized deduction. Unfortunately. Okay. All right. Thank you for that one. Uh, and what are the tax implications of life insurance upon the death of the insured? I'll, I'll take that one, Boomer. Um, so if life, it depends on the owner of the policy. So um, if a person has life insurance and they are t treated as the owner and the insured, it, it really doesn't matter who's insured, but if they're treated as the owner of that policy, then the death benefit is actually included in their taxable estate. So this can be really problematic when you have, you know, large estates and then someone bought a life insurance policy and it's not in, in trust, then when they die, that just exacerbates their state tax problem that they already had, or maybe puts them into um, the estate tax regime where they may not have otherwise been because they have a large life insurance policy. The way to avoid that is to um, establish the life insurance policy in what's called an irrevocable life insurance trust. It's a, or ILET for short. Um, the, in, in that case, generally we would have um, an ILET uh, trust drafted by an attorney. Then it would name a trustee to you know, hold title to that policy. Um, the trustee would then you know, pay premiums for, through distributions made by the grantor into the trust. And when that, um, when the insured then passes away, those those proceeds would pay into this um, this trust, this irrevocable life insurance trust, 
with no estate tax and no um, income tax implications to the beneficiaries. So it, it really just depends on how that life insurance is titled, who, who is the owner. Um, of, if people are owners of policies, you know, we like to review those and try to help advise on how best to hold title you know, to those policies. Um, you can actually transfer a uh, title from yourself into an irrevocable life insurance trust if say you're not insurable anymore, or it's just a really good policy. Um, but there are rules then that you must survive for at least three years yeah. after that transfer in order for those uh, proceeds not to be included in your taxable estate. So again, it just comes back to ownership um, and there are a few other technical rules, but we could help you know advise on that if you want more information. Okay, great. Jumping around topics a little bit. This one's for Michelle. Will IRC 174 finally be fixed by Congress? And what do you think that timeline would be? Um, I can't speak to the timeline, but just a little uh, for the rest of the audience on that. So R&D expenses has always been a hot button with um, with Congress and with taxpayers. Uh, it's it it's been temporary as long as I've been practicing, and it always gets extended. And what it is, it's it's the uh, allowance for uh, immediate expensing of qualified research and development <coughs> expenses. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, uh, the the uh, the uh, starting, I believe it was in 2023 or 2022 taxes you had to, uh, companies had to start capitalizing those expenses. And that was a real body blow to a lot of small businesses with a lot of R&D because they went from uh, being able to expense millions of dollars to having to capitalize that. And a lot of them were just not prepared um, for the impact of their on their taxes. And there, of course, there was a lot of hope that it was going to be um, re retroactively reinstated and that it would ultimately be deductible that did not come to pass so there was a lot of surprise tax bills um, <clears throat> for businesses last year so at the end of january the house um, voted to approve the tax relief for american families and workers act which includes as one of its provisions the um, going back to the immediate expensing of the r d expenses um, that is still uh, sitting, I believe, unless it's, something's changed recently, I believe that is still with the Senate and has not been uh, addressed yet, but that is the next opportunity uh, for that to be passed. I don't hold out a lot of hope one that it will be simply because it came very close last year and did not. So um, again, I think we just have to wait and see on this one. Okay, well, <clears throat> that's awesome. Thank you everybody for your questions. Thank you for showing up for this webcast today. Thank you, Charity and Michelle, as always, for lending us your expertise. Uh, now we're gonna wrap it up and send it back to chat. Thank you, Michelle, Charity, and Boomer for a great presentation today. If we didn't have time to answer your questions, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. Um, here's a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again next time.